Okay, so here's where we're at. Um, chapter 11, we finished chapter 10 yesterday. Chapter 11 is... So chapter 11 is basically a review, is a review of SN1 and SN2 and E1 and E2. And so we've, we've hit on everything that's in there. So I'm going to leave that for you to do in preparation of the final. So I'm not going to assign any in-chapter in homework problems, but I would strongly encourage you to try as many of those as you can um, so that you so that you can know that SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 are um, in good, are in, that you've got those under control. Okay. So what I was just what I was what I just said was chapter eleven is a review of SN one SN two E one and E two. The problems in that chapter I'm not going to assign for a grade, but you can do them. But I would strongly encourage you to do them as preparation for the final. There are also problems with the uh, cyclohexane rings that are in the Wednesday folder of last week. Um, and I haven't, I haven't moved those around. I'll just leave them in the Wednesday folder so there are problems um, with the cyclohexanes like we did yesterday writing the major products, as well as on the older exams. If you haven't done your Chapter 10 um, top hat problems, if you didn't do those because we finished up Chapter 10 yesterday, um, I would ask you to do those before the final, the ones that you have left over. I did go through last night and I um, tallied up all of the all of the chap, uh, top hat problems. I just haven't put them in the grade book yet. So it doesn't matter if we didn't like, technically finish chapter two, right? Right, because there were only a certain number in chapter two. Yeah. yeah. So that's fine because. In theory, we will go back to Chapter 2 when we get to other functional groups. Okay. Okay. Are we going to be getting to other functional groups before the final? Yes. We're going to do alkenes. Okay. Today we're going to do alkenes, and we're going to go step by step through, through the alkene reactions because there's some terminology we need to learn. So we're going to do that today, and then half of tomorrow and then we'll use the other half of the class if you want to ask questions or uh, there's plenty of review problems to do. Okay. So then, you know, please finish chapter 10 um, before the final. Now what we're going to start today is we're going to start chapter 12. And chapter 12 is the reactions of alkenes. So that's going to be our second functional group, although we've talked quite a bit about different alkene reactions. And we'll see how far we get. I'm not going to push, I'm not going to say we, you know, I'm not going to push as a goal to get through Chapter 12. We'll see how far we get. Right. And then whatever we, whatever we have left over, that's where we'll pick up next Monday for the second class. If you're not here... You still have you still have access to the entire book. Um, I will before the end of this before the end of well, what I will do is I'll release everything so that if you're not taking the second part of this class, then you've got access to you've got access to all the problems, etc. Okay. 
if you are, then you'll just we'll just pick up we'll just pick up there. Okay, so that's that's our plan. So you can look. I, I would encourage you to look through chapter eleven since it's just a review, and you're going to find a lot of that stuff. Hopefully, as you're reading through it, you're think you you go, okay, yeah, we did this, we did this, um, and then the problems. I'm not going to grade, but they're there for you to do, Cameron. And if you haven't finished chapter ten problems, please do that before the final. Okay. So chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the reactions of alkenes. So let's just quickly remember what an alkene, what its structure looks like. An alkene with a carbon-carbon double bond, each one of those carbons is what hybridization? sp2 which means that if I look at a double bond I'm going to have the unhybridized p orbital for each of the hydrogens or for each of the carbons and then those are going to sideways overlap to pair up the electrons to form the pi bond and the first thing and the first thing the way I've drawn this is that we should probably I should probably go back and say, well, remember yesterday I said bold and dashed wedges have like no business in a double bond, and that you just draw them, you just drew them. So which is it? Well, when I draw a double bond like this, where the all of the atoms are in the plane of the paper, a bold and dashed wedge doesn't do anything for me. You can't tell whether something cis or trans by using a bold or dashed wedge. But if I'm writing it so that you're looking at it sideways, so that you're looking at all these four atoms are basically in the plane that is perpendicular to the screen, then I can use my bold and dashed wedges because I'm looking at this sideways. So then bold and dashed wedges would make a difference. And cis or trans would be same wedge, opposite wedge. So most of the time when we write a double bond, we write it like this with all four atoms in the plane of the paper. There, a wedge, a bold wedge or dash wedge doesn't mean anything. But if I write it looking at it on the side, it's important to do that. It's important to then show the bold and dashed wedges. And we're going to do both as we talk about, their re at the re talk about the reactions. So, what is an alkene? Is it a nucleophile or is it an electrophile? Is it electron rich or is it electron poor? Well, extra lone pairs would make it extra electron rich. So, what there isn't is, are there any positive or delta positive charges here? Maybe on the hydrogens, but it's not like we started out, when we started out talking about electrophiles and nucleophiles, we had either a carbocation was a pure electrophile or a carbon attached to a halogen or an oxygen is delta plus because that oxygen or halogen is taking away the electrons. So a double bond then is a nucleophile. It is electron rich. What is making it electron rich? <clears throat>
The pi bond is making it electron rich. So it's this pi bond right here that it's that pair of electrons in the pi bond that is making it electron rich. So if this is a nucleophile, it can react with electrophiles. So let's start reacting it with the simplest electrophile of all, H+. Plus. Okay. So let me take Let me take an alkene here, 2-methylpropene, and let's react it with an H+. Now what's going to happen? What's going to happen is, is that the pair of electrons is going to be used to bond the carbon. Sorry, bond the, bond the hydrogen. So here's carbon A and here's carbon B. So either carbon A or B is going to take possession of that pair of electrons and use it to bond hydrogen, the H+. And the way we're going to draw the arrow is we're going to draw the arrow like this. So that the arrow is going to the H+. Basically, it's the equivalent of up here in this diagram, Here's my H plus, and the question is, so who's it going to bond to? The left carbon or the right carbon? Down here, it's the same thing. Where is that H plus going to bond? Is it going to bond to carbon A, or is it going to bond to carbon B? Well, if you don't know, then do this. Add it to carbon A, add it to carbon B, and write out <coughs> the two structures that you get. Yes. So you're going to pick that double bond up with that pair of electrons, and you're going to use it to bond H+. So if I have, like, if this is my, if this is my structure, if I just write the structure without the double bond, what I need to do is I need to add the hydrogen to each of those two carbons, carbon A and carbon B. So if I add the hydrogen to carbon A, I'm going to add it here. If I add it to carbon B, I'm going to add it there. What am I missing? I have a neutral molecule plus a plus one species. So what should be the overall charge of the product? Plus one. So where does the plus charge go in each of those two molecules? The carbon that I didn't add the H to. So for the top structure, where should it go? Should, where should the plus charge go? On carbon A or carbon B? B. B. And what about on the bottom structure? A. So 
So in other words, carbon A or carbon B, in this case I'm doing it with each of those two carbons, in the top one, carbon A took that pair of electrons and used it to bond hydrogen, and what happened to carbon B? Since carbon A took both the electrons, carbon B lost an electron. And then the opposite happened down at the bottom. Carbon B took the pair of electrons, leaving carbon A short. Now, what do I have? I got two carbocations. What do we do with carbocations? We add a, nu a nucleophile to it. So let's say in this case I add Cl- to each one of those two carbocations. So I take my Cl-, it comes in, adds to carbon B so that Carbon B has a Cl attached to it, or I take my Cl and I add it to carbon A in the bottom structure, and that gives me a chlorine attached to carbon A. So what did we just do when we, I'm um, using kind of the royal we because it was mostly me, but what did I just do? What did we just do? We added H plus and Cl minus to a double bond. So the final products of this reaction would be the equivalent of saying, well, I'm going to add, I'm going to react H plus Cl minus or HCl to this double bond. I need an electrophile to react with the double bond, that's the role of the H+. I then need a nucleophile to come in and react with the carbocation to give me the final product. And so in each of these, so in each of these two products, what did I do? I added HCl across the double bond. And so this is what's called an alkene addition reaction. It's addition because I'm adding two molecules together to form one, which would be an addition reaction. And so I'm going to be able to do this with any HX acid. HCl, HBr, HF, HI. I'm going to be able to do this. And what we just did was we just wrote the mechanism of this reaction to form the two different products. So what's my next question going to be? I made two products, so... Which one's the major product? Right? Which one is the major product? A or B? Or both? Anybody have any ideas, a guess? What's your guess? Um, a. That A would be major. It's a guess. Do you have any reasons why, or is it just a guess? Um. Okay. Mm, I could see that. 
No, that's not the, that's not the reasoning, but I could see it. Anybody else have a guess? Mm, that's a guess. It's not 50-50. Let me ask a question. Let me. We've seen, we've done this before. We have all of the knowledge to answer this question from what we've done so far in the last whatever number of weeks it's been. How do we, how have we determined whether a product is the major product or not? We've had two criteria. One product is the major product because it's... Okay, more substituted in the case of alkenes, more substituted meant more stable. So if we've done reactions where we form the more stable product, and that's been the major product of the reaction. So yes, we've done that, right? E1 and NH2 minus E2. So one way we could look at this reaction is we could say the major product is the more stable product. Which one's the more stable product, A or B? Take a guess. Sure, go for it. I like that answer. I like that answer a lot. But does everybody see what she's saying? It totally, it totally, you know, ignored my question about which product is more stable. But it is going to be B because I can't form a primary carbocation as an intermediate. You don't see it? Right. So, so if I asked you what kind of carbocation this is and what kind of carbocation that is, this carbocation has a carbon with just one other carbon group attached, so that's a primary carbocation. And down here, this carbon that's the carbocation has one, two, three groups. So it's going to be tertiary. Yeah, one, two, and then three over there. So that carbocation is a tertiary carbocation. Maybe you don't like, maybe let's, let me write the top one like this. And let me write the bottom one like this. That one's primary and that one's tertiary.
So my other question would have been, okay, let's step back. Let me step back and look at the reasoning here. And the reasoning is, all right, we've got two, we've used two different methods to determine the major product of the reaction, right? One is, what's the more stable product? What's the other one? The major product comes from the more stable There's 11 people here. Number eight. Left or right? Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ellie. So the more stable product comes from the more stable. What are these? What are these? Starts with I. So we've had the major product come from the from the more stable intermediate, or the more stable if there's no intermediate involved, the more stable transition state. So those are the two criteria that we've used. What's the more? What does the major product? Is it the more stable product? Or does it come from the more stable intermediate or transition state? If it's the more stable transition state, it just means it's got a lower activation energy. It's going to form faster. If it's the more stable intermediate, then we have to go back through Hammond's postulate and all that stuff. Right? That we did such a long time ago. Like, I don't know, two weeks. So those are our two criteria. Going back to my original question, which product is more stable? A or B? What's our rule for the stability of alkyl halides? We don't have a rule. There's no rule for alkyl halides, right? How many times have I said a primary alkyl halide is more or less stable than a tertiary alkyl halide? Never because there is no rule. So there's no rule about the stability of alkyl halide products. Is there a rule about the stability of the carbocation intermediates? You're damn right there is. Primary, we never write. So in this case, as we're looking through this, which carbocation am I going to form faster as an intermediate? The tertiary. I'm going to form that intermediate faster because I'm never going to form the top one. And so if I form the bottom one faster, that means the bottom product is going to be my major product. So this is going to be one of these reactions where the stability of the intermediate is going to tell you what the major product is. All right. Write the major product of that reaction on your board. So as we do these reactions, we have to answer three questions. We'll start with question number one. What am I adding to the double bond? So what two things am I adding to this double bond? When I add H, Cl. H and Cl. It's going to get harder from here, but the first thing is, what am I adding HCl? 
And then the next question is, how am I adding it? So who gets the H, who gets the CL? Okay. So what's the major product of this reaction? Or you can write them both, and you can tell me which one's the major product, okay? So write the molecule without the double bond. Okay. So here's A and B, here's A and B, here's A and B. So what am I going to add? Okay. Which one's major? Top or bottom? Okay. Okay. Raise the plus charges. You want to erase the pulse breakers, and then you're okay. Okay? So, if I'm not writing the mechanism of this, and I just say, hey, write the products, the first question you're going to ask is, what am I adding? I'm adding an H and a CL. So I'll add an H here and a CL here, and then I'll add an H here and a CL there, vice versa. I got two bonds in the two bo two carbons in the double bond. I got two things I'm adding. I can either add them this way or I can add them this way. Those are my two choices. So you can always write the possible products of this reaction. Then when I say which one is the major product, how do you know which one is the major product? Well, I added the H plus. In this case, if I add the H plus, if I add it to A, I'm going to make that carbocation. And if I add it to B, I'm going to add that carbocation. And then what happens to make the products? The Cl minus comes in and adds here to make that product. And the Cl minus adds to this carb to make that product. I know, it's pretty boring because this is, because what we're doing here is the second step of an, no, we'll get to rearrangements here in a minute or two or ten. I'm adding a Cl minus to a carbocation. That's the second step of, of SN1. Right? So when I'm adding the Cl minus to my plus charge, I'm just doing SN1. If I made a chiral center and I'm doing it by SN1, what, what would happen to the product? Like for instance here, if I make, I make a chiral center when I add HCl and I form product B. Is that product going to rotate plane polarized light? No. Why? Because you're going to get a racemic mixture because the chloride is going to add 50% from top, 50% from bottom. I'm going to get a racemic mixture. The major product here is going to be which one? A or B? B because... It came from the more stable carbocation. What kind of carbocation is the B intermediate? 
primary, secondary, tertiary. Tertiary. What kind is is A? No. Secondary. It's secondary. So in this molecule, I actually am going to expect to see some of A and some of B. But what am I going to see more of? B. Because it comes from a more stable intermediate. So this is a more realistic problem. I'm going to get a mixture of A and B. But B, remember, major products are just the percentage-wise, um, the highest percentage-wise. So even if it was like... 40 30 because you've got some other stuff being formed or unreacted the 40 wins so it's the major product of the reaction so what's new about this reaction adding h plus to the double bond that's it that's the only new thing about this and so we can add the h plus to either carbon or both carbons whichever one gives us the major product or whichever one gives us the more stable carbocation, that's going to be the major product. And when I said the second step is an, is the second step of an S, or this second step is the second step of an SN one reaction. These are electro, these are uh, alkene addition reactions. They don't mean SN one or SN two. Those are only for substitutions. These are not substitutions, these are additions. So I'm in a, to a whole new class of reaction. I've moved past SN1, SN2, E1, and E2, but as you can see, we have to remember our SN1s because they show up here. This is why SN1 and SN2 always comes before alkene addition, because it makes sense to do that. One last one. Tell me, write the write the major product. Just to write the major product of that reaction. So the major product is that one, where the H added here and the bromine added there. Now you might say, okay, do I need to know the mechanism of how to write this reaction? Yes. Immediately for Thursday's final, maybe because I might ask mechanism questions in multiple choice format, which sometimes means order like the intermediates or transition states. I can say which, trans which transition state forms in this reaction or which intermediate form, or better yet, which one doesn't form, which ones are wrong. So this is a pretty straightforward reaction. I'm adding the H plus to the double bond, forming a carbocation, adding a Br minus. Now, yes. There is no other product. It's just that. This is addition, so two come together to make one. That's why it's an addition reaction, because there are no other products. 
So if so there's a pattern to this, right? The pattern is we're adding the hydrogen to form the more stable carbocation intermediate. So that's the pattern. Now the pattern was not obvious to a Russian chemist named Markovnikov. And it's questionable as to whether or not Markovnikov should even have this rule named after him because the original paper that he wrote really didn't have much to do with this. But yet somehow in the early 1900s this reaction was given Markovnikov's rule. And normally I would say, well, Markovnikov did all these reactions and he came up, he noticed that every time he added like HX, the H always added to the carbon in the double bond with the most hydrogens and the X added to the other carbon. But in reality, he really didn't do that. But if he had, it would justify him getting his name. There are people that say we shouldn't even invoke Markovnikov here, but everybody else does. So Markovnikov's rule is when you add HX, or we're going to add H plus H2O here in a minute, the hydrogen adds to the carbon with the most hydrogens. What happened if they're tied? It adds to both 50-50. Now, Markovnikov's rule is pretty straightforward because if a carbon in the double bond has a hydrogen, that means that it would form the least stable carbocation. The carbon that has the least number of hydrogens is going to be more substituted and form the more stable carbocation. So there was Markovnik, and Markovnikov did this before carbocations were really well known. Um, I think in the late 1800s, this was not ascribed to Markovnikov. It happened sometime around the, the 19, in the early 1900s. I have 1800s and early 1900s organic books in my office, and Markovnikov's name is not on them. Yeah, well, that's just a professional hazard. But there's, but his name was only associated with a paper, and when I had a colleague whose wife was German and a physics teacher, and she was translating it for a student at another university, and he's like, you know, it doesn't really say anything about that. And I said, yeah, I've heard that. And that's why people argue that it's irrelevant, but we're going to make it relevant. So you can write the major product of the reaction just by following Markovnikov's rule. But the reason for Markovnikov's rule working is I'm going to always add the electrophile to more that form the more stable carbocation. And actually, sort of like the way we broadened out, we've broadened out a lot of rules here. That's the rule we're going to use. So I'm going to add the electrophile to the carbon that forms the more stable carbocation. That's always going to be my rule. So, the second step is SN1 for this. The stereochemistry. Here, no, char no chiral center, right? We've been through that before. If you, have a, if you have two groups on the same carbon in the cyclohexane ring, there is no chiral center. But if you did generate a chiral center, you would have a racemic mixture of 50-50. So the pattern here is that the major product comes from the addition of the H to the carbon with the most hydrogens, and the one forming the carbocation. So this is as good a time as any to introduce this term called regioselectivity. And your book, the book has shown this before, but now is the time to talk about what regioselectivity means. And I'm going to break it up into two parts. 
Regio and Selective. And I'm going to start with Selective. What does it mean to be selective? What's it mean to be selective in life? Picky. I'm choosing one thing over another. That's what selectivity means, right? I'm choosing one product to be the major product over another. What happens if a reaction only produces one product? If there's only one product, you can't be selective because you don't have a choice. So selectivity means that you have to form two or more products. That's the first thing. You've got to form multiple products and one is major. So what's not selectivity? Not selective is when you only have one product or if you have multiple products you end up with what kind of ratio of those products? 50-50. So you either end up with one product or you end up with a 50-50 mixture. That is not being selective. So for regioselectivity, you have to have two or more products, and one of those has to be major. To me, it's kind of like, I like the other term because I can immediately say, well, this isn't going to be selective. And it's not going to be selective if we only make one product. It also will not be selective if we make a 50-50 mixture of the products. What's regio mean? Regio means that your two products are structural isomers. What are structural isomers? Same molecular formula, different structure. How do we know two things are structural isomers? They have different names. They got different IUPAC names. So they have different names. That's a regioselective reaction. I form two products, they are structural isomers, and I selected one as the major product. So let's go back up to this reaction right here. Is it regioselective? No. So what we have to do is we have to write the other product. We have to write the other product even though it's not major. Because basically the two possible, and I should probably put in here, the two possible products are structural isomers. Now what are the two possible products? There if you add the groups this way, or this way. We're going to get to a point where it's going to add one way 100% to zero. In this case, I don't know what the percentage is, I just know I made a major product over a minor product. Cameron. Um, I think well, this doesn't form a primary carbocation. And and even if it even if I, I was like the last the first problem we did, that is a possible product. So this is what this is how we have to expand our thinking. The two products are the possible products by adding H, X this way, and adding H and X this way. Even if I form an intermediate that we know isn't going to form. 
The problem is selective. There's no terminology in this for 100, 0. Selectivity means anywhere from 50.1 to 49.9. A just bare major product, all the way up to 100 zero. There is no terminology for 100 to zero. So 100 to zero is as selective as 5149. And it's the two possible products in theory, adding this way and this way. So that's the way we have to define the products that we're being selective over. So in this case, one's coming from a tertiary, one's coming from a secondary, those are legit. If one was coming from a tertiary and the other was coming from a primary, even though we're not forming any primary carbocation, it is still a possible product. The way that the way that we're defining the reaction. So in this case, is this regio selective? Am I making two products that are stereo Am I making two products? Yes. Are they structural isomers? Yes. One's one bromo one methyl. The other one is one bromo two methyl cyclohexane. Did I did I make one over the other as the major product? Yes. So with those th three things being true, this reaction is regio selective. It's a regioselective reaction. <clears throat> now, let me introduce the second term. Stereoselective. And let's do another reaction to illustrate stereoselective. So let me put the double bond on the end, and let's add HCl to that. And so if I'm writing my possible structural isomers, I'm just going to write the molecule with single bonds. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to add HA, I'm going to add H to carbon A, and then H to carbon B, and chlorine to the other one. So I would have an H here, and a Cl here, or I would have an H here, and a Cl here. So there are my two possible products. Do I need to know anything about the mechanism to write those products? No, because I'm just adding this way and this way. I'm just adding them that way. Is there a major product here? Which one? A is the major product? Well, what did the chlorine add to? Carbocation. What kind of carbocation did the chlorine add to in A? A secondary carbocation. What did it add to in B? It would have had to add to a primary. Does that mean that B is not a possible product? No. B is a possible product. Is it going to form very high percentage? No, but that's irrelevant. It's a possible product in the theoretical sense. So therefore, is this reaction regioselective? Did I make two products? Did I make two products that are structural isomers? Do I have a major product? Yes. And again, that idea of major product is 5149 all the way up to 100 zero. They did not come up with a good term for 100 to zero. There's no exclusive, there's no specific, there's just selective and 
selective just means that you form one over the other, even if it's 100 to 0. So is this regio selective? Yes. What does stereo selective mean? All right, we've already been through the selective part. Same thing as before, what's stereo mean? It means that you're going to make products, and in this case, you're going to make two products that are stereo isomers of each other. And you then select one of those over the other. Okay. What are our examples of stereoisomers? Give me an example of stereoisomer. Now, and antimers, so mirror images. What else are stereoisomers? Come on, we got one. And antimers, diastereomers, with double bonds. What are the stereoisomers? What are the stereoisomers of a double bond? EZ or cis-trans. Now in these cases, how do you know that you're going to have stereoisomers formed? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to generate a chiral center. Because without a chiral center, you can't form an antimers. Without two chiral centers, you can't form diastereomers. So you need to generate at least one chiral center, except that's not going to be enough. So in this case, did I generate a molecule with a chiral center? I did. Product A has a chiral center. So does it have the possibility of existing in an RNS? Yes. Now, I've got two possible products that are stereoisomers of each other. But now I move to selective. Did this reaction form R over S or vice versa? No. As a matter of fact, what do I get? I get a racemic mixture. What does that mean? 50-50. I get my racemic mixture, why? What did, the what did the chlorine add to? A, a carbocation. Whatever you add to a carbocation, what do you always get? A racemic mixture. Can a reaction, that would, that would be, if we did that reaction, that could be stereospecific. As a matter of fact, let me come back to that in a minute, because that's an example of a reaction that is not stereospecific. Because I'll have to introduce a new term, since you brought that up. So anytime you go through a carbocation intermediate, is the reaction going to be stereoselective? No. So again, it's easier sometimes to remember when is this not going to be stereoselective. It's going to be not stereoselective when there are 
no chiral carbons or no chiral centers. It will not be stereoselective if, and why no chiral carbons? And then it will not be selective if you go through a carbocation intermediate because you're always going to get a racemic mixture and if you get a racemic mixture you selected nothing. You got a 50-50 mixture. So the reaction cannot be stereoselective unless you make a chiral center and you select. And how many reactions have we done where if we started with a chiral molecule we end with a chiral molecule only SN2. Well, number one, we're not going to be doing SN2 in these alkene addition reactions. But secondly, an SN2 reaction isn't a stereoselective reaction. Selectivity means that I'm looking at the products. And I'm looking at how the reaction generated chirality in the product. There is also something called a stereospecific reaction. And we will get to this. So in a stereospecific reaction, and if they would have consulted me on stereospecific, I would have made that 100 zero. They didn't consult with me, so it's not. Right? Because there is no term for 100 zero. So what does stereospecific mean? Stereospecific means that if you change, that when you change the stereochemistry, when you change the stereochemistry of the reactant, that will change the stereochemistry of the product. And so it turns out that an SN2 reaction is not stereoselective, it's stereospecific. Because if I change the initial reactant from R to S, what happens to the final product? It changes from R to S. So if I start with R, it makes the S product. If I change the, pro the reactant to S, I make the R product. So stereospecific has a very, a very specific terminology. And we'll come back to this because inversion of configuration is one stereospecific reaction, but then you can have others where you don't, where you end up with retention of the configuration or retention of the stereochemistry. And that's just a stereospecific. Because if I get one product with cis, and then I make the reactant trans and I get a different product, stereochemistry, that's stereospecific as well. So any reaction that goes through a carbocation cannot be stereospecific. But your first choice, your first thing is, did you make a chiral center? If you didn't, no worry. Like the formation of product B, could never be stereospecific or stereoselective because there's no chiral centers there. So if there's no chiral centers, there's no need. If there is only one chiral center, we do not know any reactions that will make a chiral product in lecture. We don't know any reactions that make one chiral center over another. Unless, and you could say, well, what about SN2? We don't know any reactions that make a chiral center, that make you know, a, an uneven mixture of enantiomers, unless we start with a chiral molecule or we use a chiral reagent. So one of the big rules in organic chemistry is you cannot make a chiral product without starting with either a chiral molecule or using a chiral reagent. And
in the lab course, for those of you taking the lab course and for those of you not, I'll describe what happened. You took this molecule called ethyl acac, ethyl acetyl acetate, and you reacted it with yeast and some sugar, and so you did a fermentation reaction. And the enzymes in the yeast added hydrogen atoms across the ketone, across the ketone double bond to add a hydrogen to the oxygen and a hydrogen to the carbon. So later on we're going to call this a reduction reaction because when you add hydrogens to an organic molecule, it's reduction. When you take hydrogens, what? That it's reduction? So reduction means you add hydrogens, oxidation means, well, reduction can mean two things. You add hydrogens or take away oxygens. Reduc oxidation is add oxygen, take away hydrogens. It's probably in the packet that of the experiment. It probably said this is a reduction. This is an <laughs> oxidation. So anyway, this is reduction. Wait, you said reduction is adding oxygen? No, it's taking away oxygen. <laughs> adding oxygen is oxidation. And I think I know what's in the packet. Just like... I think I wrote it. Right, so this is reduction. Did I generate a chiral center in the molecule? Yes, that's the purpose of the experiment. The purpose of the experiment is to make a chiral center, but what's actually doing this reaction? The enzymes in the yeast. Yeast is a living thing. It's a, it's a living organism. When you use baker's yeast, like you use to bake bread, the enzymes in the yeast will basically, since they are chiral, they will induce a chirality in the product. So that you'll actually make this molecule, in theory, at an 85 to 15 percent S to R ratio. It's not 100 percent, but it's 85 to 15. And so those enzymes do this reaction as kind of a side reaction to the major reaction, which is fermentation, converting the sugar to grain alcohol. So I show this, apparently to point out, to, there's points of confusion, but also because this, the only way this reaction occurs to give a chiral product an 8515 is an unequal mixture of, of an antimers. The only reason that this is, produces a chiral product because I'm using a chiral reagent, the chiral enzymes in the yeast. If the enzymes in the yeast weren't chiral, you would get a 50-50 mixture of R and S. And so the baker's yeast, at least, and I haven't verified the 8515 for 20 years. Um, and I should do that because I'm not quite sure that the yeast that exists now is exactly the same strain back as it was back then. Um, there are other yeasts that will actually flip this. I think champagne yeast. If you go to like the beverage store and get champagne yeast, there's one down on Mayfield Road. It's like a little, it's like a little trailer just booze all the way top to bottom um, but they sell champagne yeast because people use that in brewing so the cardinal rule in organic chemistry is you can't make a chiral product without using a chiral reagent and that chiral reagent includes having a chiral reactant but we know from SN1 that just because you start with chiral Reactant doesn't mean it will stay chiral. Okay, so that's stereo selective. And right now, we only know one reaction. It goes through a carbocation, it ain't stereo selective. 
Could it be regioselective? Yes. Can I give you a reaction that's not regioselective? Sure. And give you another one. I can give you a third one. I can do this all day too. All three of those reactions are not regioselective. If you don't believe me, write both of the products. So how would I do that? I would just add the H to the top carbon, Br to the bottom, and go vice versa. Down here I would go H to the top carbon, Br to the bottom carbon, and vice versa. H to the top carbon, and vice versa. So, so for the so for product for reaction number one, why is that reaction not regioselective? Because I only made one product. Because these two products are not two products; they are the same product. And so, how many products did I make? I made one product. And remember, in order to be selective, you have to have a choice. And having one product is not a choice. So that's the reason why product number one, or reaction number one, is not regioselective. How about reaction number two? Why is it not regioselective? Because those two products are the same. So they are the same pr one product. So for reaction number one and two, you're going to end up with this only one product, so it can't be regioselective because it's not selective. Is that the reason for number three? Did I make two products in reaction number three? Yes. We all agree, yes, that those are different products with different names. Okay, so I made two products. Did I select one over the other? No, why not? It's just getting softer as you go along. So both of those came from what kind of carbocation intermediate? Tertiary, right? The bromine, the bromine added in this case to a tertiary carbon. The bromine up here added to a tertiary carbon. So they both came from tertiary carbocations. 
What have we said about carbocations through the last few weeks? What have I said? It doesn't matter what the alkyl groups are. A tertiary carbocation with three methyl groups is the same stability as one with three ethyl groups. So in this case, since they both came from tertiary carbocations, they would be a 50-50 mixture. And if it's a 50-50 mixture, did I select? No. So that's why this one would be not selected. Now you might say, uh, I don't get this tertiary carbocation thing. Well, that's going to be rough writing the mechanism for, but for the moment. I don't get the tertiary carbocation thing. Could I use Markovnikov's rule to get to the same answer? Yes. So I look at the product, so I look at the reactant and say, how many hydrogens are attached to that carbon? And you would say, How many hydrogens are attached to the bottom carbon in the carbon-carbon double bond? What would you say? Not think, because I can't hear you think. How many hydrogens? Zero. How many attached to the top carbon? Zero. So Markovnikov's rule says those with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen. That's the them that has gets rule, which is another way to write Markovnikov's rule. Them that has the hydrogens gets the hydrogen. In this case, they both have the same number, so what's going to happen? 50-50. You're going to make a 50-50 product. The reaction's not selective. If it was 1-0, the one with the hydrogen would get the hydrogen. So, take a step back here. These three reactions are not, they're, they're not regioselective. Why not? Because in two of the cases, I made the same product. In the other case, there was no Markovnikov's rule predicted major product. They were 50-50, and so again, I didn't select. Now, I would go, I would go back and say, okay, for regioselectivity, when will a molecule not be, when will a reaction not be regioselective? When you only make one product. When are you only going to make one product? When one of the reactants is symmetrical. Now, we're adding HX, we'll add H2, H plus H2O in a few minutes. So in this case, the only thing that can be symmetrical is the double bond. So if the alkene is symmetrical, that means adding the groups this way and this way is going to be the same as adding them the opposite because the molecule is symmetrical to begin with. So when will a reaction not be regioselective? When you've got a symmetrical reagent. And then three is just the example, what if they have the same number of hydrogens in the carbon-carbon double bond? You will get a 50-50 mixture. And that is reaction number one, HX. But now I've defined all the terminology. So we'll take our five minute break, but what I'd like you to do when you when you come back is, I'd like you to write the mechanism for this reaction to form the major product. But wait, I don't know what the major product is. Okay, write the mechanism and figure that out.
All right, so this is our next reaction. And as you're writing that mechanism, as I'm writing that mechanism, I always have this sense of deja vu. Maybe you'll have that sense too when you write the mechanism. So write the mechanism to form the major product and we'll start it, we'll start back up again at 10.30. Could be. Could be. I mean, like, what's a meso compound? What, you know, what are, what are diastereomers? Yeah, those could be on there. And that was something that was on exam threes. Okay, we need to write the mechanism of this. The idea of you writing it on your own doesn't seem to be working out all that well, so why don't you give me some help here? What would be the first step in the mechanism? Double bond. Okay, so add the hydrogen to the double bond. All right, I'm going to put in carbons A and B. So where should I add the hydrogen? A, and then what goes on B? Water. Not in the first step. So I'm going to add the H. I'm going to add the H plus to carbon A, and that's going to leave carbon B with a carbocation. All right. Yep. So if we wrote the transition state for that, what would it look like? It's going to have a bond to the hydrogen and then a partial bond of the carbon-carbon double bond breaking. And then in terms of partial charges, partial positive on the H and the partial positive on the carbon that now becomes the carbocation. So that would be the transition state for the first step. My sense of deja vu with that is pretty high. Haven't we seen that transition state? Haven't we written it quite a bit? Yeah, we have. Have we written it in terms of adding an H plus to a double bond? No, we've, we've written it in terms of losing the H plus to form the double bond. Oh, so this is sort of the reverse of what we've been doing. Right. I'm adding an H plus to a double bond instead of losing an H plus to make a double bond. Okay, next. Next step. What should I do? The water is going to do what? I'm going to add the water to the carbocation. What's that transition state going to look like? Okay. Partial charges. Okay, we all agree with that? Again, a transition state we've written before. Only before we've written it, well, we've written it both ways, right? Adding the water to the carbocation and losing the water from the carbocation. All right, so then that gives us the oxonium ion. Okay, what's the oxygen want to do here? Wants to lose a hydrogen, so how do I draw that arrow? Like that. So what's the transition state there going to look like? Partial bond to that hydrogen. Delta plus.
on and Wow, it's pretty tedious. It's pretty boring because basically this is what we've done. in the past. Have yourselves a what? H plus is the catalyst, yes. Because it's used in the beginning and and uh, regenerated at the end, so that's the H plus is the catalyst for this reaction. And I could ask, why is H plus a catalyst? Why do I need a catalyst? And the reason I need a catalyst to make it a rhetorical, okay, you want to answer, go ahead. Sure. So the reason we need a catalyst is because the double bond is what? Nucleophile or electrophile? It's almost like we asked this, I asked this question an hour and a half ago. The double bond is a nucleophile. Water is a, no. Not water. Water's a nucleophile as well. So if I got a nucleophile double bond and a nucleophile water, they can't react. I need an electrophile. So what's my electrophile? H plus. So that's the catalyst. That's why we need a catalyst. If you don't add a catalyst, this reaction is not going to react. Because remember, water just doesn't break up into H plus OH minus. It does at 10 to the minus 7th, but that's not enough to make this reaction go. So there's my product, H plus and water. What if I added the H plus to the water, or H plus to the alcohol, and I formed the oxonium ion? And then I broke, then I break the CO bond to form the carbocation. And then I lose a beta hydrogen to form the final product. What reaction have I done? I've done I've done E1 specifically the the backwards reaction is called I'm losing water. Dehydration. So what's the forward reaction called? Hydration, but there's no rehydration because I didn't, because I didn't. So it's hydration. So hydration is just the reverse of dehydration. So where we've mit written the mechanism for dehydration, now I'm just writing the reverse reaction. So that's what, what I meant by sense of deja vu. We've done the reverse of this, now I just am going to add the acid catalyst to the double bond. So H plus H2O in terms of in terms of what reactions can I do right at the moment? I can do H plus H2O. I can do HX. Wait, water is very I can substitute water with an alcohol, so that means I can do H plus like CH3OH, right? Yeah, if you would do if you would if you would dehydrate from this molecule, you would the most stable product would be the one with the double bond here. So it's not exactly the opposite of it because there's a question of which double bond you form. But the mechanistic steps would be the same. So did this follow Markovnikov's rule? Yes. Because I added the H plus to the carbon in the double bond with the most hydrogens and I added the other group to the more substituted one.
is this reaction regioselective? The reaction, the reaction here of this double bond plus H plus H2O is that is that reaction regioselective? Okay. Let's take a step back to where where I was about a half hour ago. I said there's three questions that we have to ask every time we do one of these alkene addition reactions. The first, reaction, the first question is, what am I adding to the double bond? What two groups in this case? Specifically now. Now I want it specific. So when I added HX, what did I add? An H and an X. So in this case, I'm adding an H and water, which will become OH. So I'm adding an H and an OH to this double bond. That's question number one. Question number two is, how am I adding them? Markovnikov or opposite of Markovnikov? Which we haven't done yet. So if you're like opposite of Markovnikov, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So Markovnikov. So I'm going to add an H and an OH Markovnikov. Okay, so what am I adding? How am I adding it? My third question is, how am I adding it? No. Two different how we add it. First, how we add it, Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. Second, how we add it, are those two groups going to be 100% cis, 100% trans, 50-50? And how do I get rid of it? <laughs> Got rid of it. Keyboards. Here's my final product. What am I getting at? What am I getting at with that third question of 50-50, cis, 100% cis, or 100% trans? Is the reaction stereoselective? That's what I'm getting at. So how did the H add? H and OH. go that far. There's my double bond. I'm going to add the H plus on top the double bond. Where does the OH go? And? The OH goes on top and? On the bottom. Why? because it goes through a carbocation intermediate just like an SN1 reaction and so how does the water add? 50-50, lose the H plus, you got 50-50 H and OH. So it's 50-50 cis and trans. So was this reaction regioselective There are my two possible products. Are those two products different? Notice I'm always going back to the beginning here. And I'm doing that because I'm trying to mimic what you should do. 
or you should be mimicking what I do. So, two possible products. Are they different? Yes. Could it be regio selective? I haven't eliminated it yet. Of course, I could look at this double bond and say, is that double bond symmetrical? No, do they, are there different numbers of hydrogens attached to each of the carbon in the double bond? Yes, so it's going to be regio selective if Markovnikov's rule prevails. And Markovnikov's rule has to prevail because there's two hydrogens on this side and one hydrogen on that side. So the hydrogen will add to the, to the end carbon and the OH will end up on the middle carbon. So is this regio selective? Yes. Is it stereoselective? Did I make a chiral center here? Yes. But the problem is if you only make one chiral center, it's always going to be 50-50. Unless I used an optically active reagent or a chiral reagent, which I did not. So this reaction is regioselective and not stereoselective. And right now it may not seem like, oh, okay, what am I adding? You know, what am I adding? How am I adding it? How am I adding it? Right now all we've got is HX and H plus H2O. H and X, H and OH, both Markovnikov, both 50-50. Alright, I do this reaction. I add my H plus to the end carbon so that I make the secondary carbocation. Let's go back to what's today? Tuesday. Let's go back to Monday. What can happen with this molecule? I just, once I add the H plus to the double bond, I'm back in SN1 world or E1 world. So, what could happen with this molecule? Sure, it could reform the double bond. I wanted another R word. It could rearrange. So, could this hydrogen right here? Now slide over here to form that carbocation. Sure. Does that did that does that follow our guidelines? What are our guidelines? You only get one shift, and that shift has to form a more stable carbocation. Is this a more stable carbocation? Yes. So now this is a tertiary carbocation. So could this undergo a shift? Absolutely. Um, how about then your X minus, your chloride, bromide, etc. comes in. So you could end up with a rearranged product that looks like that. Would I have to tell you when to rearrange? Just like before, yes. I would have to do that. But is it possible to do alkene additions and have rearrangements? Absolutely, because, bless you, I'm going through a carbocation intermediate. And so everything that happened before can happen again. Brandon? Yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah, that was Yeah, I mean, it, the carbocation rearrangements are always you have to do them experimentally to see if they happen. So could we have that, could we take this, if I took this double bond, if I, if I let's say I could buy that, because I'm not going to make it. 
I mean, my, I'm a one-step synthesis person, which is fill out the order and have somebody else send it to me. But if I bought that molecule and I added like HCl to it, would I see any of this product being formed to sort of verify that that occurs? And then how much of that is formed versus the other one? I don't know the answer to that. Could it rearrange? Absolutely. Will it? I don't know. I don't know. Is the last time I the last time I said, "Oh, this would be a really good project to do." We did it, and I got told, and I, we're still working on it. Because the answer is, you'll see that next semester or next class. I don't know what to believe anymore. The student that's working on it's like. I don't know if I believe anything from what you taught me last semester because this is just totally wrong. And I said, oh, I agree. At this point, I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that things that things are rearranging or that carbocations are as stable as we think they are. You know, I haven't gone through the literature to see. This is a pretty basic reaction, right? So it's, I mean, what's the purpose in doing it? And the one thing that we haven't talked about is how do you, I mean, how do you know what the structure of the molecule is that you just made? Because in lab, what do we do? We take melting points and we match it up with a list of possible compounds. We might take a GC and see two peaks, but the GC just tells us I got two peaks. I don't necessarily know what the other peak is. So that's the beginning of lab that's on Monday. That's what we start on Monday in lab. Is how how do we determine what how do we determine that we form this molecule and not having the chloride up here? And that's going to involve techniques called spectroscopy, IR and MR. So the fact that you know the fact that Saitsev and Markovnikov back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, were able to determine the structures of their molecules is pretty miraculous because they don't have the techniques that we now have. Somebody could probably walk up to me on the street and say, here, here's a molecule. Can you figure out what it is? And I could probably, I could probably do it, depending <coughs> on what it is. You might say, well, how realistic is that? It happens. I usually demand payment if I do that. But I've done that for some companies. I said, oh, here, here's what it is. And they're like, oh. And then they tell me the history of it, and I don't really care about the history of it. <coughs> so it's not that they're difficult. It's just trying to figure out when they occur and when they don't. This is easy. This is paper stuff. But how much does it occur? I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see another example where we've gotten ourselves in, into a little bit of a pickle. And I can't find the answer. I can't find out who's got the answer, who's proposed answers. So when we finally figure that out, it'll be a good talk because I'll start with like, which of these two products do you think will form, and then. If it's a bunch of like chemistry people, then they'll argue and maybe even fisticuffs at the beginning. Like, which one of these two do you think will form? And then people will argue back and forth. And then I know which one it is. Definitively, I know which one it is. I just don't know why. That's not the one I would have predicted. Which is always good and bad. So how much of this rearranges? I don't know. Is it possible for it to rearrange? Yes. So fortunately, I control this world. And I can tell you, rearrange it or don't rearrange it. But now, you can say, well, I don't have to worry about rearrangements. Oh, yes, you do. Because now, even as we're adding things to the double bond, we could end up with the rearrangements because, again, that second step is just E1 or SN1. It's not going to be E1, but it's going to be SN1, so it could rearrange. Okay? So, now we have three, four reactions. 
We got eight. Now we got three. HX, H plus H2O, H plus alcohol. It's the same thing. Well, we need a few more. And we can now undergo rearrangements. So, let's see what would be next. We've talked about regio and stereo, stereo selective reactions. Okay, let's 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 bite the bullet and do this one. What's anti-Markovnikov? It's when you get the opposite product. Let's say that I have this double bond, and I'm going to treat it with HBr. But then I'm going to throw in some hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2 or HOOH. Now, when somebody did this reaction and they figured out what the final product was, the final product, the H added to the carbon with the least hydrogens and the bromine added to the carbon with the most hydrogens, which was opposite of what you would predict from Markovnikov's rule and so then this became known as the anti-Markovnikov product. And if there was an identifiable, identifiable person that did this, they would have their name associated with them, probably a Nobel Prize. But since it doesn't, I don't know the history of this. So that sounds good. Let's add peroxide and HBr. So now I get the opposite product, and the question is, why? And the answer to that question is, the mechanism is different. And how different is the mechanism? It's very different, sort of. The first thing that happens with hydrogen peroxide is, hydrogen peroxide will split apart. The oxygen-oxygen the -oxygen bond will split, and you'll end up with each of the oxygens with an unpaired electron. These are called radicals. They're also sometimes called free radicals. There are no unfree radicals, they're all just free radicals. So whenever you have a species with an unpaired electron, it's a free radical. Now, probably like most radicals, free radicals are bad. Because free radicals are very reactive. So why is this oxygen as a free radical very reactive? Because it only has seven valence electrons that it's sharing slash owning, and it would like to get to eight. And so what it decides to do is that oxygen free radical decides to react with HBr. And when it reacts with the HBr, what happens is, is that this hydrogen bromine bond breaks and the H dot that's formed, if I break the hydrogen bromine bond, and notice I'm breaking these bonds now, giving each species one electron. So they're amicably splitting up. Before, they didn't amicably be split up, right? The one that was more electronegative got everything. So now they're splitting so that this H plus then, that, or H dot that's formed, is going to combine its electron to the O dot. And so I'm going to make an OH bond, and the Br now gets, one, it gets its electron back. So there's no charges at all in this reaction because everything is splitting what we call homolytically. The bonds are cleaving so that each atom gets one electron. And notice that my arrows have changed. My arrows are now the fish hook arrows because a full arrow indicates two electrons. A half arrow indicates the movement of one electron. So when I change this reaction, the first step is that the peroxide splits apart and then the peroxide comes in and removes a hydrogen atom from the HBr, making water 
and a Br dot, which is nothing more than a Br atom. It's not a bromide ion, it's a bromide atom. It's a bromine atom. It's unstable because it would like to have eight electrons. It only has seven. So what it decides to do is it decides to add to the double bond. And I have carbon A and carbon B here. So the Br comes in, and at first, I'm going to split this AB double bond up. You can almost think of it as A with a dot, B with a dot. And so where's the Br dot going to add? It's going to add to A, and it's going to add to B. So if I split this double bond up so that it almost... I'm going to write it up here. It doesn't really look this way, but at least if we're starting out, it's going to, going to kind of look like that. If I split the double bond in half and give each carbon. So now the Br is going to pair up with the center dot. So if it pairs up with the center dot, what happens? I form a carbon-bromine bond, and then my dot is at the end. Or the Br dot can add to carbon B. And if it does that, then my center carbon keeps its dot. So this is free so this is what is called a free radical mechanism. And so my BR is going to add to the double bond. Sometimes it'll add to A. Well, it'll add to either A or B. So we're doing both. We're adding it to A, and then we're adding it to B. And then what happens once I form this radical? Once I form this radical, it now comes in, and it grabs a hydrogen from another HBr molecule, and so it generates the final product with the hydrogen now adding and then I generate another Br dot in both of these cases. So all I'm doing is adding the H. And I added the H in the wrong place up here. So I'm adding the Br dot to each one of the carbons in the double bond. That leaves a dot on the other carbon. That other carbon's dot reacts with HBr, and that's where the hydrogen adds. And then I generate another Br dot that then goes back in and reacts with another alkene and that process continues and continues and continues until I run out of stuff. Now, different mechanism, what's going to tell me the difference in what's the major product and what's the minor product? Again, don't have a rule for the stability of the alkyl halide product. There is no rule. So that means there must be a rule for the stability of these radicals that are attached that are attached to the carbons. Um, in the time, I mean, yeah. Now I could die. Is there a carbon there? Uh in the top mechanism, like here like here. Yeah. No, um, yeah, so like so this carbon is going to add that hydrogen to it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's a CH2. It's the CH2 that. So so when I originally labeled these A and B, A has the dot, and then B has the dot. So in the final product, we're doing another. 
Yeah, and, and I didn't put that in for the bottom one. So for the bottom one, it needs to look like this. And then there's two more hydrogens on that. The water. The hydroxide doesn't do anything. Oh, the water, the water, yeah, the water doesn't do anything. You might say, well, water's a good nucleophile. That'd be great if there was carbocations, but there aren't. They're all radicals. No. That's because we did. But then, like, what? Where did the that's the that's actually what we call in a free radical reaction that's called the initiator because initiator molecule breaks apart to form the radicals and then the radicals do the rest of the reaction so remember this reaction would give Markovnikov product through a carbocation if there was no peroxide so now I'm throwing the peroxide in so what does it do it splits apart well, no, this is what the peroxide does. The peroxide will split apart, and then it will pull off the hydrogen from the HBr, and now this is going to go free radical mechanism. It's not going to be carbocation. So the peroxide, there's many initiators you can use, but peroxide is, is, the is one of the best ones because it splits apart to form these, ra these hydroxyl radicals. So I just completely changed the mechanism, which I know because I now get an anti-Markovnikov product instead of the Markovnikov product. So now we're at the point of why do I get the anti-Markovnikov product as the major product? And again, it's not the stability of the final product. So it's got to be the stability of these radicals. So what kind of radical is formed? What kind of radical is this? Well, radicals are identified the same way as carbocations. So what kind of carbon is A? A has two, out, two other carbons attached to it, so this is a secondary radical. What kind of radical is B? It's primary. Which one do you think is more stable? The secondary is, but why? So what makes this a little bit easier is that when we talked about the carbocations, we said, oh, it's got six electrons. It liked to have eight. So what we did was we the more alkyl groups we attached to this, the more delta minus charge there was from each alkyl group to push towards the carbon to get it closer to eight. Right, that's why tertiary carbocations was the most stable because it had three alkyl groups pushing electron density towards it. Each of the carbons getting a delta minus charge from the hydrogens. So the more alkyl groups, the more electron density you push towards the C plus. Well, it may not seem like it, but a radical is actually in much better shape than a carbocation is. Because a, carbo because a radical has seven electrons, so it's one electron closer to eight. But the same thing happens. If you have a car an alkyl group attached, then your carbon of that alkyl group sucks electron density away from the hydrogen, and it now has some that it can push towards the C dot, and it can get closer to eight. So in terms of radicals, tertiary radicals are more stable than secondary radicals, which are more stable than primary radicals. K 
Can you form a primary radical? Actually, you can. So before we said, no way ever draw a primary carbocation. There's no such restriction on radicals. You can form a primary radical. Is it stable? And not particularly. Is it stable enough to exist in solution? Yes. And so notice what this mechanism has done. This mechanism has basically, since I'm adding the Br dot first, the Br dot is going to add to the carbon with the most hydrogens in order to make the most stable radical. But it's not the H plus adding, it's the Br dot adding. So that completely reverses how the Br and the H add. So if the Br adds to carbon B, I make a secondary radical. If the Br adds to carbon A, the Br dot adds to carbon A, I make a primary radical. Which one is more stable? The secondary, and so then the H adds there. So I change the mechanism, I change the intermediate, and now I've changed from Markovnikov to what we now call anti-Markovnikov. So that's a huge change that we can make by simply adding peroxide. And I'll point out one last thing about these sort of about these free radicals is free radicals are free radicals are, are are not good. Do we have free radicals in our body? Yes. Oxygen can exist. O2 can exist in a diradical form. And it does. That's a paramagnetic form of oxygen. If you've ever seen people pour liquid oxygen through the poles of a magnet, you'll see the oxygen be attracted to the magnet. That means it's paramagnetic. So if you breathe in oxygen, some of that oxygen is a diradical. And what can it do? It can react with like water to form a hydroxyl radical. So every time a radical reacts, it generates another radical. And that hydroxyl radical can now run around the body and start removing hydrogen from things. Like DNA, RNA, key enzymes. And that's never a good thing. But the only way to stop that from happening is to stop breathing. So I got to breathe. So what do we so what do we actually have in our bodies? We have things called antioxidants. And those antioxidants are molecules where when you when a hydroxyl radical comes in and grabs a hydrogen, those species are stable enough that they they just kind of sit there. They don't immediately run and pull off a hydrogen from something else. They kind of stop the process. So when you take your antioxidants like a vitamin E or vitamin C depending on the circumstances where there's a lot of things like resveratrol that's in red wine and other things they will they are able to stop this cascade reaction because they form stable radicals. So, anti-Markovnikov addition is when you add HBr and peroxide. And you will now get the anti-Markovnikov product. And we'll start and finish this up because I could ask you, is a free radical reaction regioselective? To stereoselective, I need to know what radicals, what radicals look like. Fortunately, they look like carbocations. Okay, so I've got your exams. You can bring if you could bring up the whiteboards. Just put the um, 